Surprise! We're back to pump some activity into this channel again. With Halloween this week and bats being so heavily associated with the holiday, I figured a talk about our world's real vampires was in order. But to really up the spookiness factor, I'm not just going to talk about any vampire today. Because there's nothing quite as spooky as a vampire skeleton. And what better skeletal vampire to talk about than the one that practically lived right here in my backyard, Desmodus Stocky, Stocks Vampire. Welcome to Batbox Beyond, where I talk about the extinct creatures of the night, bringing them back from the dead to fill you with fright. Today, there are three species of vampire bat. The hairy-legged vampire, Defila equidata, the white-winged vampire bat, Diamus youngi, and the best-known species, the common vampire bat, Desmodus rotundus. Up until very recently, as little as a couple thousand years ago in fact, there were several other vampire bat species. Vampires have a relatively scant fossil record, even by bat standards. We know from molecular evidence that they have existed in some form for about 26 million years having split from other leaf-nosed bats sometime during the late Oligocene. Their oldest fossils, however, only date back to about the Pliocene-Pleistocene boundary, so they are what you would call a ghost lineage. Yes, we're definitely checking off all of the Halloween boxes today. Of the several known extinct vampires, only two are widely known. The giant vampire bat, Desmodus draculae, and Stock's vampire bat, Desmodus stocky. The former is famous for being up to 30% larger than its living relative, the common vampire, and more recently, its extremely oversized inclusion in ARC, Survival Evolved. Stock's vampire was also bigger than its living relative, about 15-20% to larger on average. Most of the time, Stock's vampire is just treated as a bigger, more northerly cousin of the common vampire, but this fails to show just how unique the animal actually was. Aside from the size difference, Stock's vampire was more robust. Several muscle attachments on its skull were more pronounced, and its head was all around more boxy, with a rounded cranium and wider rostrum and palate. Its eyes were slightly closer together and angled forward, granting almost binocular vision. Bone articulation and muscle attachments in the head suggest that Stock's vampire was able to open its mouth wider than any other vampire. Also unusual was a smaller nasal cavity, which could suggest a smaller nose. This could have implications for their heat-sensing pit organs, although I can't imagine having smaller pit organs would be an advantageous trait, seeing as they need them to find blood-rich tissue on other animals. It's another mystery that would take an actual professional to solve. Things get really weird, though, when you look at their hind limbs, which are just bizarre compared to other members of Desmodus. The legs of Stock's vampire were, of course, absolutely longer and more robust than their living relatives but proportionally comparable or even slightly shorter on average compared to those of the common vampire. Indeed, its legs are the most robust of any bat, living or extinct. It is not quite clear what these limb adaptations were for. One possibility is that it had a more upright posture when walking, or maybe they were engaging in shoving or wrestling contests with their legs. Maybe something else entirely, and we'll never know. A personal hypothesis of mine is that perhaps this was an adaptation for rearing up bipedally on its hind legs for better reaching the areas of good blood flow on the legs of the mega mammals it likely parasitized. Comparing the skulls of D. stocky and D. rotundus does reveal small differences in neck muscle attachments and the foramen magnum. However, I'm not well versed enough in anatomy to suggest whether or not this would have had implications for neck posture. In life, these anatomical factors would have given it an appearance quite unlike any other bat, with a uniquely sloped posture due to its limbs. These all suggest a bat more adapted for terrestrial locomotion than any other, galloping as it moved over uneven terrain. Pleistocene North America is known for having hosted a wide variety of strange large animals, but this little bat may have posed strong competition in the title for the strangest. The taxonomic history of fossil vampire bats is... a messy one with many names being given to fossils and subfossils, which were ultimately shown to be the same species. Fragmentary remains combined with splitting scientists is never a good combination. As many as five fossil vampire species have been reported from North America. 
Desmodus archaeodaptes, Desmodus precursor, Desmodus stocky, Desmodus magnus, Desmodus draculae, and this is not to mention the numerous unclassified specimens simply labeled as Desmodus species, Desmodus indet, or CF Desmodus. Currently, only three of these taxa are considered to be fully named valid species. Desmodus archaeodaptes, the ancient vampire, Desmodus draculae, the giant vampire, and Desmodus stocky, Stock's vampire. The ancient vampire, D. archaeodaptes, is an older species, originally dated to the latest Pliocene. More recent examinations of the locality that it's known from suggest that it is in fact earliest Pleistocene in age, however. For a while, it was the oldest vampire species known, and thus thought to be ancestral to the other Desmodus vampires, possibly indicating a North American origin for the genus. More recent findings, however, have found slightly older vampire bats in other localities in South America, so the ancient vampire may not be the progenitor of the group after all. Desmodus draculae is the most recently described species and was most widely distributed in South America, with only a handful of records in North America, specifically Mexico. So where does Stock's vampire fit into all of this? Desmodus Stocky itself was described in 1958 by J. Knox Jones Jr., an American zoologist with a passion for natural history particularly small mammals like bats. He named the species after Professor Chester Stock, a paleontologist at the California Institute of Technology. Another Pleistocene vampire bat species, D. magnus, was described in Florida just 11 days later. Subsequent studies have indicated that D. magnus is in fact a junior synonym of Desmodus stocky. Though some researchers assert that some specimens possess sufficient morphological distinctions to be considered a separate species after all. Still, the current consensus remains that they are in fact a Floridian population of D. stocky. This just goes to show how important the principle of priority is in zoological nomenclature, as if Jones had waited 12 days to describe the specimen, we might be calling the species something else entirely. Jones himself was an interesting individual who really lived for research and added significant depth to our current understanding of the small mammals of the southwestern United States. If you would like to read more about him, his obituary is in the description of the video, along with other citations for information shared here. While on the subject of phylogeny, there are no studies proposing exactly how the extinct Desmodus vampire species are related to each other and a living common vampire using DNA, proteins, or otherwise. What we have at best is an approximation, but nothing concrete. Do Stock's vampire and the giant vampire represent a clade of large vampires, or is one closer to the smaller living common vampire? Do common vampires represent a dwarfed lineage rather than these extinct vampires being true giants? Such a study would vastly improve our understanding of the evolution of these most specialized of leaf-nosed bats. The first recorded remains attributed to Desmodus stocky were first collected in San Josito Cave, Mexico. Since then, subfossils from the species have been found throughout North America. Remains are known from as far south as Old Mexico, through New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and Florida, and New Trout Cave in West Virginia and Shasta County, California. Based on this, it's clear that at one point, Stock's vampire was the most widespread leaf-nosed bat north of the Rio Grande. Based on where the remains were found, it is evident that, like all vampire bats, they roosted in caves and cavities. Based on fossil localities and inferred range, Stock's vampire was an extremely adaptable animal that inhabited a wide variety of habitats, from temperate broadleaf forest, mixed forest, pine forest, scrubland, oak savanna, flatwoods, prairies, swamps, desert, and probably more. Of course, Stock's vampire is a vampire bat, and like other vampire bats, it would have been a specialized blood feeder. Stock's vampire has been proposed to be a megafauna specialist due to its ability to open its mouth wider than modern vampires, and their frequent association with ground sloth remains. In fact, some have claimed that the vampires that ventured into North America during the Great American Biotic Interchange were actually following ground sloths as they traveled northwards. Isotope studies could be used to determine what the hosts of Stocky and other fossil vampires were. In fact, I'm surprised a study like this hasn't been carried out yet, as it seems feasible on paper, but perhaps this is another case of less charismatic extinct species getting glossed over by the wider scientific community. But the range of Stock's vampire bat also raises an interesting question. Why could it range where it did? Modern vampires are rather picky when it comes down to temperature, and not cold tolerant in the slightest. Naturally, one would expect Stock's vampires to have a higher cold tolerance if it was found as far north as West Virginia, as even interglacial West Virginia was still capable of getting rather cold. However, some studies have claimed that Stock's vampire may not have been so tolerant of cold climates after all, and it was only present in northern areas during especially warm interglacials. Personally, I am somewhat skeptical of this claim. 
The sediment that the West Virginia vampires are known from is directly below a layer dated to the last glacial maximum, around 29,000 years ago. Remains known from Potter Creek Cave in Shasta County, California, are similarly dated to around this time period. The last glacial period in North America, the Wisconsin, began around 75,000 years ago, so there's a very large gap in time between the warm periods and the deposition of the remains. It's possible that perhaps there were changes in the depositional environment or rate, or that the remains themselves were redeposited, but it's difficult to speculate on with any degree of certainty. Further confusion is created by the absence of Stock's vampire from sites near the end of the Wisconsin where only mild winters occurred, such as Dry Cave in New Mexico. Behaviorally, we can largely only speculate what Stock's vampire was like. Something we can say with certainty is that it was quite social, likely living in large groups of up to 100 individuals like the common vampire. These groups would have shared information about host whereabouts, and shared blood with friends if they couldn't find enough for themselves. Like the living vampires, they were likely quite aggressive towards other bat species and excluded them from the best roosting spots in the cave. This is supported by Stock's vampire bones often being the only bat bones known from the sections of the cave where their bones accumulated. Today, there are no vampire bats north of the U.S.-Mexico border, outside of the occasional vagrant. So what caused the northernmost vampire species to go extinct? Three words. We don't know. The most frequently suggested causes of their extinction are climate change, ecological collapse, or a combination of the two. Modern vampire bats are sensitive to changes in climate, but seeing as Stock's vampire ranged from Mexico all the way to the northern US, they were likely more resistant to changes in temperature, which may mean they were less susceptible to snaps in climate that occurred in the late Pleistocene. In the late Pleistocene, North America saw the extinction of many animal species, especially megafauna, due to rapid climate shifts and pressure from human hunting, among other factors. It is it is possible that this loss of hosts was too much for Stock's vampire and they went extinct as a result. This raises a few questions, however. The other two vampire species in Desmodus, the common vampire and the giant vampire, seem to have made it through this transition just fine with the loss of most of their prey species, although the latter still went extinct for unknown reasons a couple hundred years ago. The common vampire in particular displays a great deal of behavioral plasticity and can adapt to a wide variety of host species, large and small. Although Stock's vampire was larger than the living vampire species, the even larger giant vampire would have also had to adapt to parasitizing smaller animals if it had a preference for megafauna. Because bat bones are small, fragile, and rarely preserved, determining precisely when they disappeared from the mainland is nigh impossible. Regardless of the exact reason or when, Stock's vampire seems to have disappeared from continental North America in the latest Wisconsin, 15 to 11,000 years ago, along with the majority of the continent's megafauna. Read from the next day here. There was something I wanted to add about possible causes of extinction, but forgot to. Namely, an oft-overlooked human persecution element. Extant vampires are persecuted by humans out of fear throughout their range, sometimes wiping out entire colonies with smoke, fire, and more recently, poisons. If Stock's vampire was already under stress from a loss of its traditional host species, they may have started parasitizing humans more frequently, which in turn would have caused persecution from humans. It's not like every single Paleo-Indian in North America set fire to every roost they could find, but it sounds plausible enough that human persecution may have, at the very least, sped up their decline by fragmenting their populations further. However, there is one final twist in this vampire's tale. Between 1964 and 1968, some bones were collected on San Miguel Island off the coast of Southern California. As these researchers categorized these bones, they found many bird species that still inhabit the islands and nest there, such as gulls, cormorants, and ox, and some that are now extinct, such as the flightless sea duck that was bigger than some geese, Chindides. But the most surprising find of all were 18 bones collected from cave deposits dated to between 5,000 and 2,500 years ago. Further inspection showed that these bones belonged to no bird, but eight individual bats. And these weren't just any bats, they were Stock's vampire bats. What were vampires doing on San Miguel Island thousands of years after they, their supposed hosts, and preferred climate had vanished from the rest of North America? This is a fascinating case of island refugia. A refugia is a place where a formerly once more widespread species survives in small numbers due to stable conditions, and islands are often instances of this, as they are buffered from sudden and extreme climate changes thanks to the ocean surrounding them having an insulating effect. For the vampires, it is possible they were tempted to the Channel Islands by the presence of pygmy mammoths, which inhabited the northern islands in the Pleistocene. Humans arrived in the Channel Islands around 13,000 years ago, 
and were likely a contributing factor in the extinction of these mini mammoths, forcing the bats to adapt and shift to parasitizing seabirds or marine mammals, something some common vampire populations do today. This novel survival strategy may have allowed them to outlast any other stocks vampire population we currently know of. Thanks to the insular nature of their last holdout, it is unlikely that severe climate effects such as the Younger Dryas would have proven fatal to Stock's vampire, although the island did lose some of its forest coverage as the Holocene progressed and sea levels rose. Unfortunately, this wasn't enough to stave off extinction forever. Between now and 2,500 years ago, something must have changed, and that something may have been human activity. Some studies have suggested that around 2,000 years ago, there seemed to have been several innovations in boat technology used by the native people of the Channel Islands. This may have allowed them to reach previously inaccessible seabird colonies and exploit them for food and feathers. This, if true, would coincide with several species ceasing to nest in the Channel Islands, and the flightless sea duck Chindides finally succumbing to extinction around this time as well. This loss of suitable hosts perhaps coupled with direct persecution from humans, may have been the final nails in the coffin for Stock's vampire. It is impossible to say when exactly this population of Stock's vampire went extinct, as it is currently only known from one locality in the Channel Islands. It is probably safe to say it vanished sometime between 2,000 years ago and before European colonization of the islands in the 1800s over 200 years ago. With the extinction of this population, what was once the most widespread leaf-nosed bat in North America vanished and this time for good. But the curtain has not yet closed on vampire bats north of Mexico. No, it seems that the American vampires may well be on their way to a resurrection. In spirit, at least. A paper published in PLOS examined how anthropogenic climate change could affect the distribution of common vampires by the year 2070. It was discovered that, as temperatures warm, suitable vampire habitat will open up in southern Texas and Florida. Common vampires are already positively affected by human activity thanks to the plethora of livestock animals we depend upon, and it is already thought that their numbers are increasing and their range is expanding. Although this range expansion in the U.S. won't be particularly extensive, it will still mark the return of vampires to their ancestral haunts. If you would like more information on the other recently extinct vampire bat, Desmodus draculae, I'd have to recommend Ben G. Thomas's video on them. It's really well made, and you can even see where I made a fool of myself in the comment section over extinction dates. As per usual, Sale was of great help not just with editing, but also with paleoclimate research and the scaling of Desmodus stocky. I would like to thank Tyler Greenfield for finding J. Knox Jones Jr.'s obituary. Without him, I wouldn't even have been able to found his name. Last, but by no means least, I would like to give a quick shout out to Mr. Tylosaur for finding some of the papers on climate changes in the Channel Islands over the Pleistocene-Holocene transition. As always, if I presented any outdated information or somehow got something blatantly wrong in the video, please leave a comment about it letting me know. I'm by no means an expert, and I don't pretend to be. If you have a suggestion for another topic regarding bats, or a species or group you'd like me to cover, mention it in the comments below, and I might do a video on it in the future. As always, thank you for watching, and have a happy Halloween.